I floated around trying to find that thing that would light me up and give me joy. And it just took a long time. It was worth it because very few people that I know truly feel fulfilled in their work. In retrospect, I didn't really like my job all that much and I wasn't particularly good at it. I would never be great at that job, but I found the thing that I was supposed to be doing and that has been such an unlock for me in so many other parts of my life. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Au, venture capitalist, Sierra founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. HD Mall is a healthcare marketplace in Southeast Asia connecting patients to over 1,800 medical providers. This covers multiple categories such as dental, aesthetics, and elective surgeries. Over 300,000 patients have accessed more affordable healthcare via HD Mall. Get yourself a well deserved health checkup. If you're in Thailand, go to hdmall.co.th. If you're in Indonesia, go to hdmall.id. Hey, Patrick, really excited to have you on the show. I'm a big fan of your original student writing as well as your book, 10% Entrepreneur. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Patrick McGinnis. I live in New York City and I do three things, actually. I do sort of media. So I have a podcast. I write books. I give talks. I became the spokesman for a tech company in Latin America last year. So that's the media bit. I do investing. So I, I make sort of the angel investments and then I'm on the investment committee of a venture capital fund in Latin America. And third is I just started a, a company with one of my good friends from Harvard and another friend that is a new executive coaching company focused on investors and founders. Wow. Amazing. Three amazing verticals that we're definitely going to get into. So I want to hear a little bit more about what you were like in the early days in your early career before you went to HBS. What were some of your pivotal decisions at that time? So my trajectory was a, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. What I knew was that I was, I had lived in Argentina as a college student and I love Latin America. And so I wanted to do something with Latin America. And then everybody was becoming an investment banker when I was graduating from Georgetown. So I thought, well, okay, let me go do this. And I got a job in investment banking and I was very bad at it. I'm really <laughs> not good at banking stuff. Like I'm not a good Excel person, pretty terrible, not a very good, I'm like good at math, but not, I'm no, no quant jock. I was just not, I was like, not good at any of it. And I was looking to get to leave and actually do like a Fulbright or some other kind of academic program, go back to school. And my boss said, listen, why don't you an interview for our, our venture capital group? And I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. And then he said, just go meet them. And so I did. I got hired in the you know, the the kind of peak 2000, year 2000, first Ooh. internet boom. And I did all these investments and then they all blew up and it was so spectacularly exciting and crazy. And then that convinced me I wanted to, you know, focus on investing. So I applied to HBS and I took my GMAT on September 10th, 2001 believe it or not. So like literally took the GMAT, got a good score, celebrated with my friends. Next morning, 9-11 happened. I lived in New York City. It was completely horrible. Applied to Harvard, got in, went up to Boston and that, you know, that was that was the next phase. Wow. What a crazy uh, ride to there. And then obviously the tech bubble there that happened. Mm -hmm. And it was there at Harvard that you ended up writing this article about two things, right? Fear of missing out and fear of better options. So how did that mm -hmm. come about? So after I got into business school, I moved up to Boston. And I come from a very middle class family in the state of Maine. You know, Harvard was such a, like for many people, I was like, wow, like, oh my God, what am I doing here? There's so many opportunities. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to interview for every job. And you probably remember, like yeah, I was interviewing for jobs that I had no interest in. I was like, why am I interviewing <laughs> at Procter & Gamble? I don't know. And then I was, you know, so many parties and trips and classes and events and I did it all. And part of that was because having been through 9-11, I was just sort of like, wow, like the world is really 
uncertain. Mm. Who knows what's going to happen? I got to like really take advantage of every moment. And so I remember like at one point or another going to like seven birthday parties on one night or something and just being like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's business school. And I was like, this is not normal. And I am not enjoying this. I'm stressed. Like I never commit to anything. I'm like, I drop in for 20 minutes and leave to the next thing. And this is not normal. So I started calling this anxiety, the stress I was feeling, the fear of missing out, shortage FOMO. And then I also noticed nobody committed to anything. They'd always wait for something better. They were all sort of maximizers. And I started calling that fear of a better option or FOBO. And I started using them all the time with my friends, it became our lingo. And I decided when I was graduating right before in 2004, the last episode or the last, sorry, edition of the newspaper, The Harvest, I wrote an, an essay, a satirical essay about these two words and how, you know, I was so glad I was going to graduate and go back to the real world where these things didn't exist because, you know, a high class problem that Harvard students have. And I wrote an article and it got really popular. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning. I can, I'm happy to explain how it made it to the dictionary, but that was the, that's how it all went down. How did it make it to the dictionary? Because fast forward a couple of years, I'm hearing about mm. it. I Googled it and I was like, oh wait, a Harvard student made this and I'm in Harvard as well. So it's a bit circular there, but how did it make it out there, break out anyway? So what happened was I moved back to New York and got a job in finance. And I didn't think about FOMO very much. Like I was too busy. Then 10 years later, the week before my 10 year Harvard reunion, I got an email from a journalist who was writing an article for Boston Magazine. And he said, hey, I'm writing an article about the origins of FOMO and I've traced it back to you. Would you be willing to talk to me? And I said, wow, like, I mean, yeah, I did that. But like, why, why do you care? And he's like, dude, it's in the dictionary. And I was like, what? So I said, listen, I'm actually coming to Boston tomorrow. Why don't we grab a beer and I'll tell you what the story is. And so I went and had a beer with this guy. His name's Ben Schreckinger. Right. He's now become a big reporter at Politico. And I gave him an interview and then I didn't think much more of it. Well, a month later or two months later, I get an email from a friend of mine that's like, have you seen the article about you? And I was like, what? And then it turned out he'd written an article that went quite viral. And it was all about me. He made me kind of the focal point of the article. And I had never been written about before, so I was very nervous actually. But the more I read it, I realized actually this is quite cool. And then I had a book proposal out for the 10% entrepreneur that had been rejected 33 times. But my agent took the article about FOMO, sent it to Penguin, and I got a book deal two weeks later. Wow, amazing. Crazy. What? And what was it like? I mean, obviously to have that feeling where it's something that you thought of 10 years ago and then now it's back. Were you surprised? Were you excited? Were you grateful? How do you feel? So I, first of all, what's so crazy is like, I really, FOMO was such a niche problem and we didn't have Facebook when I was at business school. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg was like half a mile from my apartment on campus coming up with the Facebook, like the same spring that I wrote this article about FOMO. So like then he, that made it FOMO a thing that everybody could experience. So like, thank you, Mark and Eduardo and team. But I remember I had left my, I had been through this like whole career upheaval. And when that article came out, I was very lost actually, like super lost. I didn't know what the heck I was going to do with my life. But I felt that article when it, when I saw it, I was like, this is special. This doesn't happen every day. There's something here. And I knew that it was going to turn into something. So I felt very thankful and it really gave me a sign in a moment that I needed it, that, that there was something for me out there that was special. And it, that really helped me a lot in a time when I didn't feel all that special. Right. Interesting. Why were you lost? Because supposedly, I mean, we're all masters of the universe, Harvard and be graduates, know. you know, so on and so forth. Uh, why were you feeling lost uh, ten, almost 10 years on? Yeah, well, guess what? I'm now more than 20 or I'm almost 20 and I see my classmates and the conversation that everybody has is like, I thought at this point in my life, I'd have it all figured out and I am like clueless. And I think that that's something that we have to normalize because it can sound like, first of all, it sounds a little obnoxious. Like, oh, I went to Harvard and my life's so difficult. I mean, that's ridiculous. Obviously, like we have, we have to be realistic about the many privileges that we have, but it's life is about expectations versus reality. And if they don't line up because they never will. I mean, you know, then then it's hard. And what I think my personal story was that I had gotten a job out of business school that was my first job. I lasted six months. I hated it. Then I took a job that I did like investing all over the world. But unfortunately, it was for a division of AIG and AIG blew up in the 2008 financial crisis. My stock went to zero and I ended up on a heart monitor with all the stress. And I was like, really more than that, though, like I had a plan. And my plan got blown up and I didn't have another plan. And I looked for jobs and stuff, but I was kind of like depressed about it. And 
So I just didn't know what to do. So I kind of floated around trying to find that thing that would light me up and give me joy. And it just took a long time. And I think that like it was worth it because very few people that I know truly feel fulfilled in their work. Like it's shocking how few do. And I realize now in retrospect, I didn't really like my job all that much and I wasn't particularly good at it. I would never be great at that job. I would never be the best in the world. But you know, when you write it like FOMO, I mean, it's my word. So like, who's better than me, right? So I found the thing that I was supposed to be doing and that has been such an unlock for me in so many other parts of my life. Interesting, talk about what that means in terms of unlock for you personally. I think what happens to many of us is that we're smart, hardworking people. So we could kind of be successful in anything. If you had put me in McKinsey, if you had put me at, I don't know, a million different companies, like I would have done well. But my true skills, like my area of transcendence is what Susie Welch, who came on FOMO Sapiens and is a professor at NYU, but went to Harvard Business School. But your area of transcendence is like, like what you're supposed to really be doing, like finding that and then doing it it's really, really hard. And oftentimes you only discover it because the thing that you were doing that's much more conventional blows up and you have to kind of dig deep. And so I think that, you know, for me, the unlock was number one, recognizing like, I'm never going to be awesome private equity. Like, I'm pretty good at venture, but I'm not like an awesome private equity guy, but I am really good at ideas and writing and big picture and all the things that I do now. And like, I didn't know anybody who did those things. I didn't have like role models, you know what I mean? And and still within Harvard Business School, there's very few people that do what I do. So it was very unconventional. I had to kind of abandon the treadmill as it were. And by the way, some people love private equity. It fulfills them and they find deep joy in it, right? Which is great. Like I wish I did too, but I had to find my own path and that was really hard for me. Would you mind sharing who were some of your past role models versus some of who they are today? Yeah, that's a great question. Wow. So I think I was like the guy who really looked up to like the, the managing directors in the bank. You know, like the Hermes tie. Wow. You know that stuff, like all that you get sucked into that. They're so good though. And they're so nice. I know. <laughs> they're so warm. I have some. You know, I never wear them anymore. You should go put it on <laughs> right now for you. But like that was kind of a thing. But you know what's funny is I always super so I was always like really into like literature and music. I was always like really interested in media and stuff too. And I and I super super like always held up journalists as like heroes. And so I had a lot of respect for those people, but I, I don't do that work. So that was that was the old. Nowadays, the people that I most admire, it's funny, I'm not a person that's like a fanboy person. I don't have that many people that I'm like, I want to be like you. It's never been who I am. I kind of like do my own thing. But I would say the people who I most admire are people who combine multiple disciplines. It's like, I'm an investor and I write books. I just interviewed Scott Galloway. Like, Scott Galloway. I mean, he's a professor, but he's in media and he writes these really meaningful, heartfelt books about the journey of life. That's awesome. That's the kind of person, people who are multidimensional, like a Mitt Romney, actually, like the fact he was a Bane and then he became a senator. That's great. So I think it's people who bring together many different skills in service of doing cool, impactful things. Yeah. I think that's pretty interesting because they've also gone through multiple stages of their career, right? Mitt Romney, he was a consultant and then became private equity. And then after that, he was in public service and Mm -hmm. different bombs and fashions. So how would, would you describe your own kind of like arc of your own career? It's a great question. I think I did what I did. I now very pleased. I got some hard skills and I got credentialized. And then I was able to using what I had learned and then tapping into my innate skills that I've had since I was a little kid. I've always been very curious and observer and really good at assimilating very, you know, like you read a Harvard case study and there's like a gazillion pieces of information and you have to distill oh, yeah. it into like some, like that is something that I very much can do. I travel, the, I've been uh, over a hundred countries at this point. And when I go, I'll be in like, I don't even know, I was in Dubai last week and I'll see something that reminds me of something in Peru. I'm really just good at making the connections in my head. So what I do a lot now because I told you I'm doing these three things. I've got the executive coaching, I've got the media stuff, and I've got the investing. They all feed into each other. They're about spotting trends, reading people, and then trying to take and make them better and build. And I did this test recently, which was very, totally revelatory. I was like, whoa, it's called NBI. And I took it. It's like a, shows you how you, you think and what part of your brain you use. And I wow. found out, yeah, it's cool. You should do it. Everybody should do it. That I'm 50%, like I'm all one part of my, I'm like deeply like right top quadrant. That's like everything for me. And it's 50% imagineering and 50% strategic. So I'm not supposed to be in the detailed spreadsheet. That is not where I'm going to win. And like, had I known that 20 years ago, it would have been very comforting because I was always like, God, I suck at this. Well, now I don't have to worry. Yeah. And what's interesting is that you also coined the words FOMO and FOBO, right? For a better option. Could you mm -hmm. share a little bit more about that? Because 
It's interesting because everybody coins words, right? You know, And the truth is most words become more relevant over time. If I think mm-hmm. about it, most words become less and less relevant like telephone. I mean, people mm-hmm. don't really understand what a telephone looks like these days. So why do you think it's become more relevant? I think you mentioned Mark Zuckerberg was a big mm-hmm. bit of it as well. But just share why you think it's happening. Yeah, so it is insane. Like FOMO, when the pandemic hit, I was sitting in my apartment reading Twitter, which is very unhealthy. Don't do that. Don't do that ever. But like, especially during a pandemic. And everybody was like, FOMO is dead. FOMO is dead. And I was like, this is really bad for me. Good for the world, bad for me. And then now it's like back with a vengeance. Why? What is happening? Well, FOMO, FOBO, fear of missing out, fear of better option. They really are, if you think about what unites them, it's Mm -hmm. a desire for more and maximization. More, Mm. bigger, faster, whatever. The FOMO is you want, there's a lot of psychology there, but that's kind of a basic part of it. And what is going on in our world is that we are so inundated with things. You go online and you want to buy, like I I go on Amazon to buy like just socks. There's like thousands of pairs. What are you supposed to do with that? I was just, I think I mentioned I was in Dubai last week. I stayed at this beautiful hotel. They're like restaurants and they're all amazing. It's like, how am I going to deal with this? So I was like, this is insane. So we live in a world where these are afflictions of Influence. If you're living in a war zone, you're not going to FOBO because you, you're just trying to make it through the day. That's a luxury good. But that's really what's happening. And I think that's part of it. The other thing is that we just live such digital lives. FOMO didn't exist. I mean, it's existed. Obviously, it's part of the human experience, but the triggers are largely digital. It's information driven. Information is the trigger for all FOMO. And so the more information you're consuming, the more likely that you'll experience FOMO and FOBO. And what's interesting is that it feels like FOMO is way more well known than FOBO, Mm. I think, in terms of lexicon. Do you have a point of view on why? It's a great question. So FOBO has had a few moments like New York Times and stuff like that. But it has not, and I've been trying to like elevate it. I think it's two things. The first is that FOMO is way more fun. Like it's funny, it's a meme. Nobody's doing a FOBO meme, right? And the second that I think that FOBO is a much more, it's darker, it's much darker. FOMO can be funny. It can also be a real problem. But FOBO, it's like, it ruins people's lives. Why do people not get married? Because they just swipe, swipe, swipe all day long forever, stuff like that. And also it tends to affect people who are, older and more affluent. So it's not as fun for internet culture. So yeah, that's what I think. But I actually, I often say this and I think people say this to me too, when they hear about FOBO, people will say like, that's actually the real problem. FOMO, ha, ha, whatever. But FOBO is really what's holding me back. And so a lot of my work is around decision-making and about overcoming FOBO. Let's go into that. Why do you say that FOBO is a darker one? I mean, fear of missing out makes sense, right? It's like, ha, ha, I had seven birthday parties. I got to pick four of them. But why is the fear a better option? Why is it a dark? I mean, it's definitely different, but why is it darker from your perspective? So they're both, they both can be very dark. Like FOMO, if you think about it, when FOBO becomes a pathology is that you have created an inner narrative in which you're comparing your life to some idealized form of your life that doesn't really exist. And you're now, you're telling yourself a story that is not true, that is devaluing, you know, like, ah, I suck. So that's really bad. Don't get me wrong. But FOMO can be positive. FOMO has can be an incredible motivator to get people off the couch, to live life, to go do things, to experience. So like we can see the positive. It's kind of like wine. A little bit of wine, you start dancing, you go talk to the person you want to meet. Too much wine, you know, not so great. You're going to fall over. FOBO is like smoking. Bad for you, bad for the people around you because FOBO is about trying to minimize and eliminate every risk in a decision, which is impossible, by the way. And therefore, it holds people back from whether it's picking a movie on Netflix to watch or whether it's like making major life decisions, people are paralyzed and paralysis is extremely damaging to people. It's interesting because that paralysis reminds me of like the fear response triggering either flight or fight, right? You know, yeah. flee or fight. But then I think it's only this year that I learned that there's something called freeze, right? Which is the other response, which is the paralysis response, which is actually a common response, which is quite surprising to me. I think when you said that, it reminded me about that. Why do you think so many people are starting to freeze up when they're trying to make these decisions? Cognitive overload. I think a lot of it is that. It's just like, I'm the guy who, this is my job to not have these things. I'm supposed to be the (laughs) expert. And so I'm very, very in touch with my FOMO and my FOBO. I'm very, very in touch. And I've had to develop a whole cadre of strategies because I feel it all the time. I really do. And now I'm ruthless about it. I have a whole ways that I deal with it. But like, I just think that like in our modern age, we just are so, our lives are so chock full of stuff and information and choices that when I was a kid, I grew up in in the 80s. Like 
There was like 13 channels on the TV. It was easy. It was like we had one phone in our house. It was like rotary phone kind of thing, right? Now it's like our TV is on our damn phone. And there's like unlimited, there's unlimited content. So it's just like, that's the stuff. Yeah. You mentioned a cadre of strategies that you deploy now. So could you share a little bit more about what's in your toolkit? Yeah. So I have a, a I did a, when I wrote my book, I did a, a bunch of research because psychologists write about this stuff. Thank God. God bless them. Every university, somebody's writing about FOMO. It's like insane. I love it. But also I've developed strategies over the years. And so I, I combine my sort of lived experience with research-based analysis. And my favorite one, which I did a TED talk about called How to Make Faster Decisions, is we make three types of decisions in life. What I call high stakes, low stakes, and no stakes. Let's start at the bottom. No stakes decisions are things you're not going to remember in three days. It's going to be like, what did I have on the airplane on Friday? I can think about it. I'll be like, oh, I had like hummus and pita. Yay. It was delicious, by the way. But they're not important. But you just have to make them. And most of those decisions you make every day without thinking about it. Right? Low stakes decisions are things that require a little bit of criteria. It's like, which hotel should I stay at? Or which printer should I buy or whatever? But you're not going to remember making that decision in three months, say. And then high stakes decisions are really important things. And what happens is when we have FOBO, we tend to, the high stakes, the low stakes, and the no stakes all feel really, really big. And we overanalyze, like go on Netflix and then 30 minutes later, you've not decided and you just give up. So what I do with no stakes decision is I outsource. I literally, where are we going to dinner tonight? I don't know, you choose. I'm at the restaurant. I can't decide on the menu. I ask the waiter, what's your favorite thing? Good, I'll get that. I literally, because if I knew the answer, I would choose already. So if I'm indecisive, it means that I just never going to, I'm putting the drama in. And by the way, if that person then says you should have the chicken and I'm like, actually, I, I wanted the fish. Then I know it's problem solved, but like I really outsource. And, and typically with the no stakes, what I do is I flip a coin, literally heads or tails, chicken or fish. And so, because I, you can't ask everybody all the time, but if I'm like sitting at home and I'm like, should I go to the gym today? I don't know. I'll literally look at my phone. If it, the time is even, I go. If it's odd, I don't go. So I do that all the time. Low stakes, I outsource to people. Like which printer should I buy? Well, I know a friend who knows a lot about that stuff. I just ask them or I'll read wire cutter in the New York times, which recommends things like I just find an expert and outsource. And then uh, high stakes, I have a, it's a much more complicated thing, but it's really about doing a ton of diligence and then basically forcing yourself to eliminate things, you know, through like a kind of ruthless process. So you get down on one thing and you just choose it. Right. And what's interesting is that for those high stakes decisions, a lot of them, you're doing them in the context of venture capital, right? Where you have to make decisions, investing in startups. Could you share a little bit more about how you make those decisions? Maybe not from a generic, obviously VC perspective, but you know, how you think about using these pruning and strategies? Yeah. So I think the really interesting one for VC is the FOMO one because, so I'm part of a VC fund. I'm on the investment committee of a fund and we have what we call our FOMO folio, which is literally the deal that comes in the door that like, it's like everybody's investing in this company. It's like, oh, Sequoia's in and Kleiner and Founders Fund or whatever. They're all in it. And you're like, wow, that valuation is really high. Like what? And you're like, this deal is cool. Could be interesting, but like at half the valuation, we would say like, this is a great deal, but the price is wrong. We have FOMO. We really want to do it, but we know that we shouldn't do it. So we're putting it in our FOMO folio. We're not going to do the deal. We'll track it. We'll see what happens and we'll learn. It's like an anti-portfolio kind of. So I think really being in touch with what are your motivations? So many times investors do deals motivated on who else is on the cap table or what's the hot flavor of the month and really understanding how much of your investment decision is based on fundamentals versus FOMO. That's like deeply important in diligence. And you know what happens is like people have very messed up incentives in funds because they're like, well, some people it's pride, it's looking cool, it's PR, it's fear of missing out on the deal or whatever. All those play in and it's natural, but that is really thinking through the why on a deal. Because in VC, it's also hard because you don't know yet, right? Like it could work out, but like that's been a big part of my career, learning how to think about that. And I think the reason why is because early in my career, we invested in everything and it all blew up and I had to clean it up and it was terrible. And then with FOBO, what I think happens there is investors, investors do this thing that's just very, not very nice, which is like great company founder, but you know, can we just see like another couple, come back in a month with your, your figures and we'll take a look. And they keep dragging it along. And I think that also, like the best thing you could do as an investor is give a fast no to a company. That is the right way to play the game. 
like it's either you have to have conviction. And so companies that get strung along by venture capitalists, like they don't forget that. It's very disrespectful. I mean, you mentioned about messed up incentives and funds. You want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm also in venture capital, so yeah. we can talk about it. I think one form of messed up incentives is I think people who are investment committee, so they're senior, right? And they're investing because they see performance. And I think the people who are not in carry, they're not thinking about a long-term investment. So they're very much more maximizing the deals that have the opportunity to climb up. So I think that's one interesting time differential in terms of performance, I guess. Yeah, for sure. And what's kind of interesting is, so when I started my career at VC, I was right out of college and I didn't know what I was doing, but I didn't know that I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was like super smart or whatever. And so I remember doing these investments and like sitting on boards and acting like I was a big man at the age of 25. And these poor founders, like they, they probably thought I was awful. But they needed me because I had the line to my boss. So they had to be nice to me. And, you know, then when the VC market blew up in 2000, a lot of the junior people exited because you don't really need, it's not like a heavy analytics game. What's happened now is with the new wave, all these VC funds are massive and they have very younger professionals who've never seen a downturn, who've been investing in everything they touch turned to gold because it was like everything was up and to the right. And I feel like one thing that's interesting when you talk about incentive is like they're they're not experienced yet. And so their incentive is to get experience and do as many deals as they can. And like, I don't fault them. It's the job of the senior people to put the guardrails on. But then they also are so rich sometimes and like they're just off in the golf course that they're not even. So I do think that we've seen over the last five, 10 years, like a real lack of rigor in the venture capital industry, people investing in like anything. And I mean, look at NFTs for goodness sake. I mean, my yeah. goodness. And you know, there's no, the, talking about incentives, like the, the People don't like think about Sam Bankman Fried and his investors, like the Sequoia investors who publicly said that like he was playing a video game when he pitched them and they make that investment and they lose all their money. Did they have to, what happened to them? Did they get fired? Like what was, what was their punishment? Like probably nothing. So there's a real lack of accountability when it comes to the lazy investing of some of these people. Yeah, I think it is frustrating. I mean, I think NFTs when I was coming out, I was very much like, this looks like a pump and dump because oh. you could be scarce by the tokens of that system, but but I don't know. They'll be like saying that I abide by the copyright system or some tier mm -hmm. three country. You'll be like, yeah, it's copyrighted there. It's scarce in that copyright registrar, but it's not copyrighted in America or available places. I don't know. Yeah, but you do remind me that there's a lot of really weird incentives around the Web3 VC space. I think it was just yeah. the most egregious version of it because it was so short term, right? Yeah, it's like something people don't talk about. Like, I love this conversation because really, by the way, and I acknowledge it's easy to rip on people who made dumb investments. Like I've made some too, so rip on me. But I find the sort of the lack of accountability of people who make really bad investments. There's a lot of arrogance. I just think it's too bad because the biggest opportunity we have as individuals is to learn from our mistakes and do better. And people need to be humble enough to own their failures. That's the only way you grow. Right. Do you think it's going to get better in venture capital? I mean, one part you mentioned is the down down rounds or downturns, but is it like a structural thing? Is it like, you know, are we doomed to six, six cycles of this? How do you think it's about such this? such an interesting question. Well, I don't, what do you think? You go first. I go first? <laughs> yeah, well, you tell but me I think first. I was reading this interesting research paper that said that boom cycles happen every decade because the old ones that like you said, retire and then the new generation takes over. So we're destined to like boom and bust. That's a very Hayekian point of view. But yeah. I thought that was a very funny research paper that was saying that central bankers on these leadership at the top are about 10 years. So there's a new person coming on. So that could be one version of it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, so I would say that number one, VC is a good thing. It's a good force in the universe. So we should just say that. Like there's a lot of good things done by the industry and, and it's getting better in some ways. Like it's getting much more traditional. It's more diverse, like all that sort of stuff. I love that. I'm like, I'm not anti VC at all. Like I, you know, no. What I think is that we're going to see a period, by the way, what I'm saying is I don't think it's all that novel, but number one is you're going to see a bunch of funds just go out of business. Like they can't raise a second fund. It's going to be like bloody. Then I just read yesterday that 70% of US venture backed companies need to raise within the next 12 months. So that's going to be cray cray you're going to see just very bad things but that's the nature of the beast but then the other thing is if i were a founder with a crappy company that needs to raise money i would just say i'm doing climate ai and then i raise all the money i wanted so that is the thing that's so funny is it literally yeah there's a huge retrenchment unless you've got ai or climate in your business model i mean that's so it's that's crazy right now so nobody learned anything like you literally ai companies are just raising off of like if you literally we could 
just you and I tomorrow could come up with a deck called like AI something or other, and we would be raising money. And that'd be fun. We could be co-founders. We'd love that. Let's start a company. There we go. Let's just start a company. Earth.ai, probably taken by now. Sky.ai. Let, let's do podcast.ai. We'll have, well, actually, I have a section, a friend from HBS who's starting a, a company in that space. So we could just partner with him. But anyway, yeah. it's not. But I think it's interesting because you're describing like a lot of the hype cycles that are happening. I mean, Good and bad, right? Like you said, NFT was a hype cycle. AI is, a, I guess, larger hype cycle. It is a bit more. Yeah, and you're in Asia of... too. It's so interesting when American, like, and again, this is not like a super novel point, but like, you know what? I was just in the Middle East. I was in Singapore and the Philippines last year. And when Americans go to a place like the Middle East, like Dubai or Singapore, which are very different places, but have some similarities, you're sort of like, man, like, this is the future. This is where it's all happening. New York City feels so yesterday in a lot of ways, right? And so the opportunities are huge, but then the hype cycles are even crazier. Like the fact that you have these like coffee companies, like pick up coffee and stuff that are like VC backed and whatever. I mean, oh my goodness, it's crazy. No well, offense yeah, the to tricky pick up part. coffee people. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, the awkward reality is that Singapore and America are more similar in the sense that we have the same GDP per capita, right? But, mm. you know, many countries in Southeast Asia, they're around the 9,000 mm, GDP. Right per capita, whereas the US yeah. and Singapore are 90,000, right? So it's like a 10x difference. So Singapore and America are like listening to the same music, paying the same price on Netflix. And then for a country that's around 9,000 GDP per capita, when they double their GDP per capita in the next 15 years, if they're growing 5% every year, it turns out they really want to buy coffee and, you know, air conditioned seats and things like that. So it's actually an interesting dynamic where I think the investment opportunity is real. I think that's what people really want to buy, consumer and all these basic stuff. And then we have this very new venture capital model that's directing investments to a risk frontier. It says that a risk frontier for the US is space and AI. And in a country, it's air-conditioned Starbucks, you know? Well, it's interesting too, because obviously the US is one market. And so it's easier, like Southeast Asia, which is massive, but like it's fragmented. So it's hard to be multi-country. Like people do it, like Grab did it obviously and did it really, really well. But if you think about like the challenge of being great in three markets, what's the MVP they say, or what's the, it's like VIP, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines. If you're deploying in those three countries at once, think about how many things you have to do well. It's so challenging. So hard. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy hard. And talking about crazy hard, could you share about any times, any hard stories in your life that you found at a time where you had to be brave? After the financial crisis back in 2008, that I mentioned, I ended up with a heart monitor from stress. I'd never, I mean, it was crazy. Like I had this whole health thing and I was very afraid. I felt really scared and I felt very lonely and, and ashamed. And I remember actually one, I was so sick. I had the virus. It was like kind of like long COVID almost before we knew what that was. And so I was, I was like a bit of a recluse. I wasn't seeing people and I was just like, I don't know, I wasn't feeling happy or well or whatever. And then I recovered. I felt better and physically and, and mentally over some months. And then I was like, what am I going to do next? And I knew that I needed to leave my job, but I didn't know what to do next. And I decided to take a sabbatical. I quit my job. And that process of quitting a job without another job was extremely hard for me. I felt very afraid. And I had money, savings and things. It was like, it wasn't financial so much as really about identity and being able to know who I was. Because I think sometimes so much of our identity is caught up in our work. And so doing that, quitting that job, walking into my boss's office was deeply terrifying. And I did it. And then I felt a euphoria because I'd done something that I didn't think I could do and I had succeeded. And it was the first step to everything that has come ever since. And so one thing I would encourage people, I think my lesson from that is that like we, we get sometimes tempted to think that every decision in life, big decisions are like make or break decisions. Like this is it. Like this is the fork in the road. And sometimes they are. But in general, a decision is just a door that you walk through to your next set, next set of decisions and doors. And so I think that I tended to put, I put way too much drama into it. I should have just, but I did it. And it it was a brave moment, so I'm glad I did it. Could you share more about that heart monitor? What was it for? Why did you even have to be on a heart monitor? Oh my goodness. So I, oh, this is so terrible. But so I was at a board meeting in Charleston, West Virginia, which by the way, is like a whole, that's a whole other situation. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I had these night sweats and then I had a swollen gland and I was like, there's something really wrong with me. I went to a doctor 
he took my blood pressure. My blood pressure was like off the charts. And he was like, what is going on with you? He's like, we need to check everything. So he, I had every test and then they went to, I went to the cardiologist and had the thing and everything was okay, but it was stress. Stress is a killer. And I didn't meditate and do, I was like pretty unhealthy in some ways. I was definitely like, did not take care of myself the way I should have done. So yeah, that's what it was. And I ended up getting, losing 30 pounds and running marathons and getting in shape and taking care of myself and starting meditating and all this other stuff. And like, it's a long process. That's a life process, but that's what happened. And it was a very lucky thing that I learned that lesson at that time. Why was it so hard to quit from your perspective back then? I didn't know anybody who'd done that. I was not raised to quit my job and take a sabbatical. That is not something that my parents did. Like my parents had jobs. And I felt, I think I felt just very, like a combination of deeply ashamed of having worked in this company that failed. And even though it wasn't my fault, I was like, God, I'm really blew it. And like, who? Were, and also I think really though, I didn't know what I wanted to do next. And so the idea of leaving something without any idea what I wanted was deeply terrifying to me. But that I had to go through a, like a process of sort of deprogramming myself in order to find the thing I wanted to do. Right. And that deprogramming, what do you think you had to deprogram? Oh, so my brother, my brother is an artist. He's a musician. And he said to me, you should get up every day for six months, not knowing what you're going to do or three months or something. And I was that's like, terrifying. that's crazy. I know it was crazy. And then I did it. And what I realized was like the whole value system that I had become really obsessed with or ingrained in to me, like private equity is the greatest thing on earth. And like, which is by the way, not true. There's, it's nice, but there's other things too. I had to get, I had to get out of that and realize like private equity is not the only thing you can do. And I think that that when I was at HP, that's what everybody did. That was the thing. And there's a very famous thing. People say that if you want to know what's going to crash next, look what all the H grads are doing. But I think it was that it was recognizing that I didn't have to, I could have a much more, you know, multi-dimensional path than I than I knew I, I could have. Awesome. And if you were to look ahead into the future next year, what are those dimensions that you see coming together? It'll be interesting. Like, it's funny. Like 2023 was such a, a crazy year for me. Like it was a terrible year for the world. Awful. For me, it was wonderful. I became the spokesman for Mercado Libre, which is an amazing company. I made a TV commercial for them. I've been doing events with them. Like stuff like, and that came out of nowhere. They called me one day and they said, hey, we're thinking about this idea. And that has been such an amazing, I was in a movie in 2023 that is uh, actually out now called This Is Not Financial Advice. You can probably get it on your plane if you fly. It was on, it was on my flight on Qatar Airways. And so you can see me in that. So like those kinds of things that came to me, people called me. So there is an element where I just don't know because you will get exciting calls, fun and interesting things. And then, so that's the nature of being an entrepreneur is that some things you just can't generate. And I've learned that and you kind of have to trust. And then on the, the parts that I can build, like this launching this company in the coaching space, it has been such a wonderful experience, partially because I have business partners, which I hadn't had and I miss that. And so having a business partner, it makes everything better if you vibe with them, but also because it's the first thing I've done in my career that has felt like, I don't want to say easy. I'm not saying easy, but like, it's so natural. Everybody that I talk to about it is like, yeah, this is, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is, I see you should be doing this. And by the way, let me introduce you to a potential client. So mm -hmm. I have so much inbound right now. I can see the moment. Maybe it's this year. Maybe it's next. I don't know when, where I'm, I want to do it. Part, I don't want to do it full time. I still want to do other things too. It's going to be part of, of what course. I do, but I can see the moment when I have a really, you know, I'm kind of in demand. I'm, you know, can't take anybody else. I'm working with amazing people having real impact and I can see it like very clearly. I know it, what it looks like. And I'd never had that before where I just knew what was going to happen and I felt very confident that I could do it. So that feeling is very helpful. Amazing. On that note, I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways I got from this conversation. First of all, thank you so much for sharing about your early career decisions. I really appreciate you sharing not just about the decisions you had to make, but also a lot of the feelings behind it in terms of the uncertainty, the stress, and the concerns that you had, which obviously is the shadow of everybody's life, but also thank you so much for sharing that. Secondly, thank you so much for sharing about fear of missing out as well as FOBO, fear of better option. And I really enjoy our conversation about the light side and the dark side the utility, but also the detriment of that in today's society. And also talking about why we think that these options, these terms are becoming more popular over time to describe what we're describing and feeling. And lastly, thanks so much for sharing about how you worked very consciously to bring them all together. The cadre of techniques and strategies you use to deal with them, not just for the low stakes, low stakes, but also the high stake decisions. And also how you're looking to further advance your own career based on these principles. On that note, thank you so much, Patrick, for sharing. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.